Welcome to this month's Lit Lunch Online. Uh, and this month we have a very distinguished contributor to our programme in Margaret Busby, OBE, who is truly a publishing legend and also an extraordinarily busy woman as she is the chair of this year's Booker Prize committee. Uh, they've announced their shortlist recently, so I'm sure it's all go. I'm sure you're rereading all those novels uh, and maybe you haven't the faintest idea what is going to win. We'll look forward to the results uh, in November. Uh, so I'd just like to say thank you very much for joining us. I know it's quite a thank task. You. Well, thanks for inviting me and I hope I can keep my wits together <laughs> after all I'm that. Sure, I'm sure you will <laughs> be able to. We are here to talk about your wonderful anthology, New Daughters of Africa. Um, and just to say actually a little bit more about you and make your ears burn a little bit. Oh, You're a fellow of the Royal I'm not Society. listening. <laughs> <laughs> fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Um, and you founded the publishing firm, co-founded Alison and Busby and became the, I think, the youngest, the only female uh, black women's publisher in Britain. Um, so you've been a real trailblazer all your literary life. Uh, you are also obviously a prize judge, a critic, and a stalwart supporter of women's writing. So we're going to look at the, um, the book that we're discussing this lunchtime, New Daughters of Africa, and look how many of them there are look how huge it is yeah. um, i've got lots of questions about how it's structured but we should probably go back to daughters of africa and yeah. that is the the book i'm sure it's just as huge that came out in 1992. this is it right and that's that's the thing itself so another another whopper um, yep. so my first question is the way it's structured, did you go back to the format of Daughters of Africa for this? Yes, Daughters of Africa is structured chronologically by era or, or year or decade of birth uh, of, of the author because I wanted to show very clearly that there is this long history of creativity uh, by women of African descent. And, and I also included some traditional writings and some oratorial, uh, not necessarily written creativity. So it, it was trying to show that it's not just in the last century, the last few decades, but it goes back generations and centuries uh, that we can actually read and enjoy the work of women of African descent. It's harder to find the things. next volume. It's harder to find things further back, though, isn't it? Well, it, it is, perhaps, but I, 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 well, I always say I live in a library. I have so many books on my shelves and piles on my floor and everything. So I, I was always aware that there was this huge amount of material that I was enjoying, but it was not necessarily being as widely appreciated as I thought it should be. In fact, what I did Daughters of Africa, which was in the, well, I began putting it together at the end of the 80s. It came out in 1992. And in that era, you would have thought that there were just a handful of women of African descent who anybody knew. And they, they were mostly American, you know, whether it was Chris mm. Walker or Toni Morrison or Maya Angelou. And I wanted to say, yes, they are, they are wonderful writers and they are in that Daughters of Africa. But I want to say there are hundreds more and you can go back to ancient Egypt and look at some of the creativity that's happened in the 18th century, the 19th century, and right up to date. So I was trying to show that. And the same thing is true of the new book, because the Daughters of Africa had in it um, more than 200 women. And New Daughters of Africa has, again, more than 200 women. So I wanted to show that it's not a field that you can exhaust in one volume any more than you can say, well, the new volume is just of recent writing. Because again, in, in the new volume, the earliest uh, contributor was born in the 1790s and the newest one was born in the 1990s. So I just wanted to show there is that whole range of, of time and, and 
creativity and, and interaction between the writers. And you know, it's been a joy to, 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 to put this anthology together as, as it was for the first anthology. And I can do another find, one tomorrow. <laughs> do you find that people um, also collaborated in a sense of saying, um, yes, I'd like to take part, but have you also heard of this and I can introduce you to that person? It, it kind well, of grew and spread, didn't it? Mm. The first volume was done in a slightly different way. In the first, with the first volume, Daughters of Africa in 1992, I sort of curated it in so far as I went to my bookshelves and my piles of books and put together the, 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 the people that I thought would, would be, should be represented and I, the permission, permissions were obtained from the publishers and so on. But with the new volume, I wanted to, well, not, not only I, but the publisher, Myriad Editions, and the interesting thing about both volumes is that New Daughters of Africa was commissioned by Candida Lacey, who also commissioned Daughters of Africa in 1992. So she also had that passion to, to showcase the work of, of writing by women of African descent. But with the new volume, we wanted to make sure it had some sort of legacy so that it wasn't just a question of putting it together and, and it, it sold well and then it goes out of print and so on. So we wanted to see how to do it to ensure that not only were the women inside the anthology showcased and the fact that they connected with, with each other. The first volume connects very much with the second volume in that there are people influenced by the first volume, people con connected by relationships like you know, in the first volume with Alice Walker and the second volume we've got Rebecca Walker and we wanted to find a way of doing the anthology that would have an ongoing benefit to African women and African women's writing and literature and language so we approached or I approached everybody in, in the anthology saying this is what we want to do and we're not going to be able to pay any sort of token fees. So everybody who's a contributor actually waived their fees, which is a really wonderful gesture. And because of that, we've got this award, which is called the Margaret Busby New Daughters of Africa Award, which is a collaboration between Myriad and SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at London University, which means that an African woman student from Africa will be getting a free course of study and accommodation at SOAS in a language or literature course because of this anthology. And the in fact, the first recipient, I think, is, is starting or has just started. And we're hoping to find, you know, crowdfunding ways to keep it going so that it becomes a perpetual award for a woman student from Africa. So that's the legacy of New Daughters of Africa. And as I said, one of the fascinating things is the way this volume interacts with the last volume and the way that the women writers connect with each other. Not that I mentioned there are relationships, like in the first volume, there was a Ghanaian writer called Mabel Dove Dankwa. In this volume is her niece called Naa Dove. In this volume, you have Zadie Smith, but you also have Zadie Smith's mother, Yvonne Bailey Smith, who's, who's now writing. Um, she had a career as a family therapist and she's now retired, but she's become a writer. Oh, she always was a writer, but she's, she is writing and she is in this volume. So there are familial connections. There are people who are influenced by each other, whether it's people who are influenced by Audre Lorde. There are people who in the first volume were not well known, but who now are known. There, there are people who began writing because of the first volume, because they, they thought, well, I am Af an African writer. I may not be born in Africa, but I can claim that. And so it's wonderful to see the way the book has been a great help, not only to those in it, as well as to those who read it, but hopefully to the next generation of writers who can see themselves showcased and, and you know, can benefit from reading these writers who have such wonderful ways of saying such important things and tackling so many issues and you know it's a win-win situation.
Well, that goes back to the individual pieces because I suppose I might have thought that, oh, it's all going to be fiction. It's all going to be short stories, but actually it's very diverse. It's, it's political speeches, poetry, memoir, mm. all kinds of pieces of writing. And, and is that true of Daughters of Africa as well? That certainly is true. Daughters of Africa, again, did cover poetry and non-fiction of every sort, short stories, extracts from novels, any kind of genre that you could think of. And the second volume does as well, but I didn't curate it that way. Mm. I, I started with a spreadsheet of hundreds of names of people I knew of, I, I wanted to include. And as you said, I would sometimes approach a writer and say, would you be in it? And, and she might say, well, Yes, I'd love to, but have you thought of so-and-so? So there were one or two other people who helped along the way like that. And again, it was not a question of asking somebody to write what I thought they should write. I would approach a novelist, for example, and say, will you write something? And she might send me back some poetry. So it, I was not telling people what topics to write on, what genre to write in. But somehow it's all come together in this wonderful way that, that seems to have been <laughs> deliberate, but it was really just serendipity. Did you also have a spreadsheet of African countries, maybe, you know, with flags and pins and things? Because, <laughs> I, I mean, the whole who you included, I, I did see one piece that was in translation, but I imagine the definition is women of African descent, both in Africa and the diaspora, but yes. writing in English. Is that no, not at all. Broadly, there, there, there are a few more in there that I didn't see. There, there, are, there are translations from other languages. There are translations from European languages, from African languages. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that is also true is, is that it wasn't that there are so many people who have different connections with so many different parts of the world. They may not be born in Africa, but they may have got connections with Ghana or, or Nigeria or, or they have connections ancestrally, but there are people who visited countries and, and it, uh, maybe next time I will do some sort of spreadsheet with flags on. <laughs> I can't even tell you off the top of my head how many African countries are represented or how many countries in the world because you know, there are African people in so many different countries, women of African descent writing, whether it's in Germany. In the first volume, Daughters of Africa, we had a woman from Turkey who I bumped into in London at a party by, by accident. In fact, I thought she was from Nigeria, but she turned out to be from Turkey. So, you know, there were places where you wouldn't think necessarily there were going to be a, a, a community of African women writers, but there were people who actually did contribute. And it's similarly with this volume, there are people from different parts of the world who are of African descent. There are people from different African countries who have connections with the rest of the world. So it's, it's just a, a very global anthology. And it's, it's, it's themes reflect those, those I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's, an, it's a world anthology of international writing by women of African descent. And they're all daughters of Africa. <laughs> I was particularly touched by Zadie Smith's contribution, which is a speech she gave when um, receiving an award for her writing. Um, and I think she calls herself a distant daughter of Africa, um, which, it's tremendously touching, really, that she, you know, such a prestigious writer feels so privileged to be included. And were you touched by that as well? Yeah, I was touched by so many things, and that, that's one, certainly one of them. In fact, let me read you a poem that actually... It's, 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 I was reading it again this morning. It says something to me about the way... It's a sisterhood. Mm. Everybody in this hand thought, in fact, I gave them a name because I was just so touched by the way everybody said, okay, I don't need a fee. Let's, let's make this happen. That's why I, I gave them all something I call VOTAS, V-O-T-A-S, which stands for the Venerable Order of True African Sisterhood. So this is a collection of 
vote test holders. But now, let me read you. This is a poem by Rachel Eliza Griffiths, and it's called Chosen Family. When you find your sisters, you'll still look over your shoulder sometimes to see if you're being followed. You're hoping one or two sisters you don't know will want to see where you're going. When you find your sisters, they won't ask you where you came from because they'll already know. And if they don't, they'll be busy putting good food on your plate and asking you if you're hungry or broke. When you find your sisters, your people, they'll tell you to use any bathroom you want, marry anybody you want, work side by side together for long hours in close quarters without any fear of being harmed. When you find your sisters, they'll throw the ball to you, offer you their love song, and say you need to listen to this track and dance with us whether or not you know all the steps. When you find your sisters, they'll say, do you remember? And you'll say, yes, until you remember together the different ways the whole thing happened. When you find your sisters, they'll say, wear whatever you want, wear the tightest dress, wear the pants, wear your birthday suits. They'll say, we love your skin and drag and natural hair, and we love you naturally, so please just live and don't let anybody kill you or tell you they've killed you and you'll just find the dead where you are. When you find your sisters, don't leave them and don't let them off the hook when they're in the wrong. When they're trying to take themselves out of the world, lay your hands on them and call them yours and yours and yours. When you find your sisters, be sure you're, you've been preparing your heart the entire way by loving your difficult self and what you pretend you don't know but you do know so that when you see them smiling into your eyes, the soft or tough flags of their hands covering yours in a truth so light and fierce, you see you all have been midair for some time and could go higher and burn some shit up if you remembered what else is good everywhere and everywhere you look. And that's the chosen family. And it feels like this is a chosen family and we're all here to support each other and that's how it happens. And one of the, the other things that touches me about New Daughters of Africa was that I found out I was in Trinidad. I went to the Bocas Literary Festival, the Bocas Lit Fest in Trinidad in May last year, I think, for the... We had an event for New Daughters for, and there were local authors who, the contributors who took part in this event. And there were two of them who both said something similar, which was that they'd been thinking of giving up writing and then they got my email. And that kind of changed everything for them. And they went on, in fact, one of them is going to be having a, a novel published next, next year. So this is what I wanted to do to try and validate a lot of these writers who have got a lot of wonderful things to say in beautiful ways but who don't necessarily have the attention or have had the attention or are given the, the space to develop and, and to shine. And to see that happening is, is just such a, a thrill, so inspiring and so, so gratifying. Poetry is um, very condensed naturally, but you've had to pick quite short entries, haven't you, from people? Mm. I mean, because there are 200 writers, um, some of the extracts, especially of fiction uh, and even autobiography, they're, they're very tantalising. I mean, it does mm. make you want to seek their work and, and read more. But was that <laughs> a little bit, uh, was that rather poignant for you that you had to maybe you know, well, keep everything quite short. Yes, I, I really wanted to to showcase as many women as possible. And as I said, we've got at least 200 women in this, vol this volume. There, there were some women, m most of the women, most of those 200 are uh, living writers. There are some who are not living. Sadly, two who were contributors died since the book was published. One was Andrew Levy. Another one, and these radical yes. and I. So there are those who are still with us. There are some who, as I said, were born in the 18th century, the 19th century. But I wanted to try and 
yes, to encourage people to discover more about these writing, these writers, which is why in the first volume, there was a quite a large section at the end, which is bibliography. Because I wanted to say, well, I'm not saying these are the only writers you should read or the only works you should read. I'm saying, here's a start. And similarly with this, now we have the age of the internet. You can go and do your own research. And that, what I'm also not saying is, these are the only important writers you should read because there are a lot of writers who are not in here who could have been, who should be, who might be in the next one if I'm allowed to do another one. And that's sometimes it's just a question of the practical things that didn't happen. Like I had to do so many emails. So, okay, you want to have a piece from this person or that person? Is this the right email address? You send it get no reply, follow up, they send you something back, you say, well, you know, we need to have it a bit shorter, can we edit it, is this all right, where is it, so all this is going on. <laughs> so I wrote about, you know, 6,000 emails in, in, in the 18 months I was putting together. So all of that was really just to try and say, there's such a wealth of creativity out, out there, and because somebody is not in this volume doesn't mean to say you can't discover them for yourself or start with these and read more. Because I, what I don't want is there to be this feeling that there are only a handful of writers of African descent who are worth reading because they're the ones that most people have heard of. And we, we know those big names and they're wonderful and, and most of them are in here, I hope. But I wanted to say, you know, you don't have to stop at 200. If I said to you, name 200 European women in, you know, over the centuries, it would be an impossible task. So there's many more than can fit in this volume. And, you know, even though I said, name, name me now as many women of Latin descent as you can think of without looking, <laughs> that would be... <laughs> You know, so many, and, and that, that, that's the point of trying to keep some of the, the, the pieces tight because they all deserve to have a whole volume to themselves, each writer. They're, they're part of something, they wanted to be part of something, so they were all in agreement about saying, okay, we might have to limit it to two or three four poems or three or four pages of, of whatever it is, but we'd rather be in it than not be in it. So thank you everybody who's in it. And those of you who didn't get back in time, hey, we'll try again next time. <laughs> what did you think about the, the younger writers? I mean, you're obviously discovering people uh, who are probably new to you. The younger voices in the anthology, um, have things moved on for them? Can you see any kind of sense of progression over both anthologies really? I think what happens a lot is that writers are influenced by other writers, mm -hmm. influenced by changes in society, and obviously things have changed in the last 20, 30, 50, 100, whatever years. So there are all sorts of changes that happen and, and that every writer, including the writers in both volumes and, and the New Daughters of Africa in particular, pick up on and learn from. So, and, and sometimes this question of things not having changed, so things that were important to write about you know, 30 years ago or 100 years ago may still be important to write about. It's, it's, it's not as simple as saying, well, the writers have all moved on because they're a different generation. And what is also fascinating to see that you can tell that they've been influenced by the younger generation have been influenced by writers who have gone before them, which is wonderful because it shows there is some point in reprising some of those writings, some of the, the works by those, those authors, not forgetting them. And it just makes the, the current generation be able to draw from a much richer pool. 
Now, I'm going to ask a pretty awful question now. If you <laughs> were to single out, putting you on the spot here, if you were to single out three pieces that you especially love, I mean, it's all great. It's such a wealth of amazing writing and wonderful writers. And I love the biographies, actually. The little biographies of every single writer are fascinating. But if there were just three that you were going to tell us and say, you know, these are the, these, not the standout, but you know what I mean. If you were going to sell this book on three contributors. I wouldn't do it. Do it. I wouldn't do it. What I would do is do I, I would read to you from, okay, I'll tell you the, the first piece in the anthology is by a Nigerian woman who was born in 1793 called Nana Asma. And mm. it, well, it's, it's, it's actually, it's very touching. It's about a friend of hers who's died, it's a lamentation for Aisha. And she's really talking about sisterhood. She's lamenting a friend of hers who died. And I'll just read this little bit because it's, it shows you why I didn't really want to single out any writers because I think we support each other and, and they support each other. And this is just to say how much she misses her sister. And I miss my sister because I lost my sister in the last few months as well. So it's, it's very poignant for me. Oh, my eyes weep, my eyes weep liberally for my loved one as a consolation for my grief and a companion for my gloom. Shed copious tears for the loss of Aisha, the noblest of our dear ones of my age group, my friend. This poem was written because there is no one else like her from among the brethren. How long my nights dwell in her, how long my nights dwell on her. How often she helped me to forget my own grief, and how often she helped me most kindly. The depth of my sadness and loneliness after her death has grown. Oh, the multitude of sorrows, the deepening of my gloom. Know you that love, when firmly established, is priceless. There is no child who could make me forget that love, and no brother, nothing that could soothe me, not even all sorts of riches. Therefore, my heart withers from worrying. Sigh after sigh rises up from my grief. Tears have continued to flow constantly, as if they would never dwindle or cease. I cry for her with tears of compassion and of longing and sympathy for her and loving friendship. So that's what holds this book together. It's loving friendship and that sisterhood. And it wouldn't make sense to single out any one or two or half a dozen writers because that's what I was trying to rail against by putting them all together. The fact that you often hear the well-known writers being given all the attention at the expense of all the others. So I want them all to share in the, in the glory of being in this wonderful book. It is a wonderful book. I would, um, I, I had a little think about this myself. So just as a little tester, uh, Danu Kogbara, who was born in the 50s, her experience of being kidnapped in Nigeria is absolutely astonishing. I love Zadie Smith's. We have the great Diane Abbott, MP, uh, talking about how we must support development in the Caribbean, and that was a parliamentary speech. Mm. And then a wonderful piece by a young writer born in the 90s, Chinolo Operanta. I don't know if I've pronounced it right, but her piece called Trump in the Classroom <laughs> about creative writing, I think is an astonishing piece of writing that just mm. hits on, it doesn't go where you think it's going to go. It's really yes. extraordinary. So, and there is so much more. There is yes, so many you, more. You voices. pick some good choices. I mean, you could look at every single piece and you will see why they're in there because every absolutely something which may connect with other pieces or may be absolutely unique. And Donu's piece of being kidnapped, or not, not many of us will have to go through that experience. It's, it's so rewarding to see how a writer finds strength in whatever their situation is and how, how they come out of situations, especially when they're writing memoirs that make them stronger and, and more positive. And I, I'm just in awe of so many writers and full of admiration. 
We're full of admiration for you as well, Margaret. It's a wonderful <laughs> achievement. So New Daughters of Africa, published by Myriad Editions. Thank you very much for talking to us. Uh, and you. I hope uh, everybody goes out and buys this fantastic <laughs> book. I absolutely loved it. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, Lily.